you know, Graham, we just so love this. We so appreciate it, uh, what's been uh, imparted to us here over these hours. And maybe before we get into this, you want to talk maybe about some of your resources there? There you go, you're on. Low battery light. Is that it? I don't know. Can you hear me now? No. Take that one and you want to take the pack so you can get a battery in there. All right. Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, talking about identity, which we weren't, but anyway. <laughs> This is called Living Your Truest Identity, and it really is about um, how you're known in heaven and how God intends to partner with you on earth. So it's a revelation about, it's really understanding about how to receive um, God's understanding of who you really are and the practical process of how you actually partner with that so that you become everything that... uh, the Lord wants. And then this is one of my favorites. It's about delight. And, you know, delight is about finding enjoyment, gladness, joy, and pleasure in who God is for you, with you, and through you. And then it's about, again, it's, uh, delight is a huge key for me in terms of uh, everything I'm doing. It doesn't really matter what I'm doing. If we're in warfare, I love to fight. I mean, it's an absolute delight and a pleasure to be on the front line because it's like, it's not like you're going to lose, right? (laughs) So that's about as much fun as you can have without being illegal. So (laughs) the practice of delight, and it it is extremely practical. And this is is a prophetic soaking CD that has healed more bodies and minds and relationships than almost anything I've ever done. It's, well, that's it. <laughs> it's gorgeous. I listen to it myself. <laughs> you know, we get, we get saved once, but we get redeemed every day. Right? And that's a very cool part of that process for me still. Excellent. Well, we're going to take a little time. I got a few questions here, and more than a few, actually. And uh, we'll get you wired up there. Might be a little easier with that, that other microphone. All righty. So, is it me? It's going to be me, right? I can mess up any PA system anywhere in the world. It's a real gift. It's just not in the Bible. <laughs> All righty, I think we're there. Uh, I'm ready, Steve. Okay, so I may jump around here a little bit because of questions. I didn't have a time to organize them. So, okay. but, uh, but if you get on something that you really feel you want to talk about, I may want you to be released to really talk about it. The, the new man, you've been talking about that. Is it, is it primarily educational or experiential? <laughs> well, I think everything in life is educational if you, you know, are not stupid. <laughs> but everything in, the king, everything in the king, all knowledge in the kingdom is experiential. To say you know something but you don't have an ex- encounter with it or an experience of it or a lifestyle in it means you don't know it. You know it in your head, but... You know, otherwise you don't know it. So for me, the whole new man thing, it's I am totally thrilled to wake up new every single day and to approach everything with a sense of awe about what am I going to discover through this situation about who God is for me and who I can be in him. So uh, for me, everything that we're doing in the new man is about encounter an experience, absolutely. I mean, you can only know someone by really encountering them and then opening your heart and letting them in and then sharing life. And I have so many friends that I know in that way that I have, I've had encounters 
with them. I, we have experiences in friendship together. And to me, that's just such a gorgeous part of life. That, you know, I'm not scared of anything, um, but I am excited about 98% of my life. And the other 2% is I'm excited about what I'm going to learn. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but I plan to be thrilled. You know, I want to be astonished. I want to be delighted. I want to be amazed. I want to be in awe. I want to marvel. So I've, I'm setting myself up to have those encounters. And I, and I think they start in our mindset. If you have a mindset that you want to, that you want to understand the majesty of God. You know, I remember the Lord saying to me one time, Graham, what would it take for you to believe that I'm unceasingly magnificent towards you? And I was going like, new brain, a new personality. And he said, I've already done all that stuff. What would it take? And I just, I just said, Lord, just open my heart as wide as you can and give me an expectation and I'll run towards you. And that, every day that's what we do. Every day we start out. I love the fact that every day is fresh. You know, I'm, I've been living in Lamentations 3, uh, 21, 22, 23 for the last 12 months. And it's, it's brilliant, you know, because it's, it's about new every morning is the mercy of God. So I've been on this plan with the Holy Spirit where at the end of every day, I walk around, you know, my living room and I just give God thanks for the day. And then whatever I messed up, I apologize for and all of that. And then I just end the day right there and say, okay, Lord, this day is officially over. I'm going to bed. I'd like you to put me out. <laughs> but when I wake up in the morning, I'm starting again. And, and it's been brilliant because I wait. What it means for me is I don't carry any stress any tension, any negative thing over into the next day. I start every day fresh. I've got a couple of situations going on um, with, uh, uh, there's some warfare situations involving friends that I'm really delighted to stand with them in. Um, but it's pretty hairy, um, which is the fun side of it. But here's the thing is, I said to them, Okay, we're going, to, we're going to get in this fight together about this thing, and then we're just going to start every day fresh, because you can beat the enemy by staying fresher longer. The enemy wants to wear you out, but here's the thing for me is we're just practicing patience, and he doesn't have any. Right? He lost all of that when he got kicked out of heaven. He has no patience. He has no peace. So I always feel like I can depress him with my joy. I can weary him with my kindness. You know, I can frustrate him with my patience, which is like, that's just so brilliant. Everything you do with God, you automatically do against the enemy. So every day I start fresh. Like, we've been in this fight now for seven weeks, so it's 52 days. But this is my 52nd, tomorrow will be my 53rd first day. And you know, we're not tired. We're not weary. We're fresh. And so when we go in, we have a team of lawyers, when we go in, it's like, no, we're fresh. We're good. We're enjoying this. And when we see our protagonists, you know, and they look haggard and weary, we walk in and say, hey, how are you doing? We're doing great. You know, I just want you to know we're really enjoying this. <laughs> New every morning. But here's the other side of that too, is I don't, carry, I don't carry over any negatives into the next day. So, but the other thing too is I don't carry my blessings over into the next day. Because yeah, we're not allowed to accumulate stress, Right? When you carry stress over, you're accumulating 
your own demise. You know, you're building up this, these toxins in your system. But here's the thing, we don't need to carry over the blessings of God, because they're new every day. And maybe that's what fullness is. You know, we're not trying to eke out the blessing of God, make it last as long as we can. You know, it's like, no, it's fresh every day. It's like new manna. I mean, Israel learned that in the wilderness, right? Breakfast flying in every morning. I mean, and on one day you could gather enough to last a couple of days. Brilliant. I want to practice that life. Just saying. That's good. Now, when you say living in lamentations, I, I get, you know, with the warfare you're talking about there and how... What, is that, what does that mean? Do you like get like a passage that comes into your heart and you realize it's more than just <clears throat> casual oh, yeah. reading, but it's going to yeah, be a part yeah. of your, like a parable or your life or whatever? In the old days, you know, before everyone got a copy of the Bible in their house, you know, like in England, you know, um, a lot of people were unschooled, unlearned, and all the Bibles were written in Latin. So it wasn't until Caxton invented the printing press and then people began to get educated that they could actually read scripture for themselves. And so what, um, what the, your pastor or your minister used to do was he would pray for every family and every person and he would give you um, a passage of scripture. And in our heritage, spiritually, it's called the rule of life. So like, you know, Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. And so it's like, that becomes a way to live. But we also, the Bible also talks about the prophecy of scripture. And this is where, you know, the Lord, you know, you have those moments when you're reading something and suddenly it seems to jump off the page and wrap itself around your head. You know, and you know that you know that you know that God is giving you something. Yeah, so I have, you know, um, Psalm 91 is one of mine. I, I have a number. But, but I, love the, I love Psalm 91, and I have studied it. Me and the Holy Spirit, we talk about it all the time. And there are so many promises in it. You know, I'm spoilt for choice. But, you know, so, but it's all about the secret place. And when he gave me Psalm 91, he said, Graham, I, I want... I want you to live where I live. I want you to live with me. I want you to be in that secret place. And so that's why one of the, the things that we did in that was we, he said, I want your office. I said, haven't you got one? <laughs> and he said, he said, yeah, but I want yours. And, and I, I, want it to, I want you to stop having an office. I want to turn it into a meditation room. Uh, sweet, and I want it to be a creative writing environment, and, and I want to meet you there. So I remember the first one we ever did 20 years ago. You know, we went out and we, we bought art. I mean, the place was empty because we just moved, and we went into this place, and I thought we were going out to buy like a chair and a desk. And I know it's on the agenda, but we came back with art instead. So we had stuff on the wall, but I was sitting on the floor working. <laughs> it was just so funny. And, so, and, and then we created this environment. And every time I've moved, we've created a different environment. So I moved to Santa Barbara um, six years ago. And we have created probably the best, the most amazing, the most incredible environment Ever. I mean, you walk into that room and you feel like you want to shake hands with Jesus. And, and in that space, it's like the enemy cannot get into that room. Nothing negative can last in that room. I've had people come in, just burst in and they've been angry and so on. And then within like about 45 seconds or something, maybe not even a minute, they just stopped and stood there. And I'm sitting there going, hey, thanks for dropping by. <laughs> so uh, why don't I just pray for you? Nothing negative lives in that room. It's an environment. It is my secret.
place. And I have friends now who are doing that in their, in their, in their own houses, in their own offices. I don't do any business in, in my meditation room. I do it next door in Jenny's office. Jenny's my PA. And I bought her a couch so that I could sit on it. <laughs> and we do everything in there. Because I'm a great believer in environments. And here's the thing with the new man is God is creating an environment in you where he's present. So we don't need to be asking God to be present. We're just actually letting the real presence on the inside of us rise up. You know? So I'm a great believer in those things. And I love hanging out. So when I, when I, when I got Psalm 91, it was a secret place. It became a real practical thing with the Lord. Well, let's, let's just create one together. So I love scripture, and I have so many of the scriptures that I read aloud to the Lord. And, uh, and I've got prophetic words, obviously, which is an extension of that. And then there are great times when the Lord just comes and says, Graham, read Psalm 91 to me. I mean, he just likes my accent. <laughs> great. Read Psalm 91 to me. And so I read it out loud. And I can almost sense him like his eyes closed going, oh, love that. Oh, yeah, love that. It's like, great. I am so excited that all of that truth is in your life. And I'm going to make it real for you. He's a talker. (laughs) And he's a smiler. How do you... uh a creative environment like that. I mean, like for folks here that they may not have an office or something, like may not have space to right. do that. But, but what are things that they could practically do to create an environment for just them and the Lord? You just really fill it. I mean, really, it's got to be a partnership thing. It's not something you do for the Lord. It's something you do with him. So it, it could just start by maybe you just need the right kind of chair or something. You know, and for me, it's, you know, because I'm English, every time I expect the Lord to come, I, I, always, I always make him a cup of coffee or a cup of tea if it's the afternoon because I'm terribly British. <laughs> and one of, my, one of my dreams is by the time we finish chatting, that cup is going to be empty, you know. But So I, I just, you know, you just need to sit down with the Lord and say, so what kind of room would you like? And, and then the fascinating thing is people from around the world have dreams about me. It's like, you know, or God spoke to me. One guy wrote to me and said, um, I had a dream and God spoke to me, but he used your voice. And he told me to buy these stocks, and so I did, and I've just sold them, and I've made over half a million dollars. So I just wrote back and said, um, and my commission is? <laughs> I said, if you're thinking about a commission, could you give it to not for sale? It's one of the best anti-human uh, trafficking agencies I know. But people send me art. And when I look at it, and they send me the story of it, and it's like, oh my God, I know exactly where that goes. And so from every place I sit or stand, I can see something that I connect with prophetically or in, uh, in some kind of revelatory way. So it could just be like that. You know, you just maybe uh, have a budget and go out, just do a bit of shopping, um, you might be amazed at what's around your life right now. Yeah. I mean, I started in one, one of the houses, like, I don't know how many years ago. My closet was the little room under the stairs. And so we had three kids and, you know, and one's a girl, so she's like 10 times more messy. And so, you know, there's like, it's like walking through a war zone. It's stuff everywhere, you know. So, um. That little space under the stairs was my room. And Sophie would come along sometimes and like knock just to see if I was, Daddy, I'm just seeing if you're still alive. 
making sure that Jesus hasn't taken you. She was always that Jesus, you know. She would come in and complain to me, Dad, I want you to have a word with that Jesus. What's he doing now? <laughs> and he was just talking to her, and she was like, uh, about one of her girls in school that she wasn't getting on with, and she's, he just told me to love her. I mean, like, seriously? I want you to have a word with that Jesus. <laughs> Anyway, I think environment is really what God wants it to be for you. And so uh, mine is a, a very creative thinking space. Um, for one of my friends, it's a place of peace. Another, it's a place where uh, they rest. So when the pressures are on and stuff, they go and sit in that place because the environment acts on you. Yeah? So it's whatever the Lord wants to be for you at that time. And then when he wants to change the environment, then you can do that too. I've changed my um, secret place environment. I think this is my fifth time now. But I love it. I believe in it. And it's a space I can walk into and I'm right exactly where I need to be. And it's almost like everything gets left at the door. And I come in and I feel like my mindset shifts. You know, my heart is glad. It's, it's an environment. I believe in it. Um, one of the things that came up, I, you know, you didn't talk about it very much, but is about discipline. And you know, there's a lot of books on, right. you know, there's some pretty famous books on discipline. Yeah. How does discipline, could you explain that again? How do you feel yeah. discipline fits in? Yeah. I think, <clears throat> discipline comes after God has done something, not before. So you don't discipline yourself. It's like disciplining yourself to pray. I mean, he is the most gorgeous person to talk to. So I don't understand how that cannot be a pleasure. But he was one of my friends, uh, a guy called Chris Sakabusi, who was uh, an athlete. Uh, in the British Olympic team and won a gold medal at the Olympics. And, you know, Chris is as honest as a day is long and he trains like a beast, you know what I mean? He's really into this whole, you know, athletics and everything. And I remember he'd won a gold and a guy from the BBC was interviewing him and he was like fawning all over him saying, thank you for all the times when, you know, you got up in the morning at five o'clock on a cold London, you know, and ran the cold, rainy London streets and thank you for not having a party lifestyle and for looking after your nutrition and all the sacrifices and things you made and, and all the disciplines and the things and now they've all borne fruit. And I can look at Chrissy's face, it's like, what? And he went, no, 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 no. He said, look, there's nothing about discipline here. Discipline is an outcome. Delight is the process. I get up in the morning because I like running. I love training. I love being fit. And I love, you know, I, I work out with the Lord when I'm running. He said, so I am delighted to train. I'm delighted to complete, I, to compete. I do everything from delight. And discipline is just the outcome. Yeah, there are times when, you know, I want to go out and I'd love to have, to have a, you know, a burger or something like that, but I know I've got an event coming up, so I don't do it. But I don't, but it's not, I don't do it as a, I don't not eat a burger out of discipline. I, I don't eat it because I have the delight of doing this. It's a, so discipline is an outcome of delight. And you almost don't even notice when it's there. Does that make sense? We, we make a big deal out of all this self-effort stuff because we're still of the mindset that we have to do something to get somewhere with God, which is the most ridiculous thing ever. You already are somewhere with him. And everything in God starts with a gift because that's how he wants it. So 
for, for the world, you perform in order to get something. In the, in the kingdom, you perform because you have something. So in the kingdom, the performance comes after the gift, not in order to get one. Performance comes after the blessing, not in order to receive one. Yeah? Now, everything has to perform. Your pension plan, the government, hopefully, your whatever sports team you follow, whatever artist you go and see in a concert, everything has to perform. But in the kingdom, performance comes after something, not before. God does something, we perform. We take it and we perform. Everything is a gift. Yeah? So that's what Chris was saying, really, is that now, I'm motivated by delight, and discipline is the outcome. So the guy, the, the reporter was stood there going, I don't understand a word you just said. <laughs> hey, we know that the old man is dead, so how do we set believers free from generational destructive patterns in life, such as addictions and so forth? This is where I believe in the power of... Um, counseling in that present past situation. You know, when we come to Jesus, sometimes, you know, we, we get saved into the idea of Jesus, but often not the reality. So because we've got, we've got so much trauma and damage going on, we'll try and get help anywhere. And sometimes people need to get saved in the counseling process. And uh, with any kind of addiction, you know, uh, no matter what it is, whether it's drugs, whether it's a sexual addiction, whatever it is, um, <clears throat> there is a process for getting rid of it. And it's really important when people have been massively traumatized that we deal with all of those hurts um, up front, for free, no strings attached, but then we lead them into the process of salvation where they can actually have an encounter with God. Now, sometimes, you know, people get an encounter with God, but then need to know what to do with it. You know, so I really believe that counseling um, is not a place just where we work stuff out, where we work on the old man. I believe counseling is a place where we encounter the majesty of truth because it's the truth that sets us free. Sometimes, you know, if we, get, if we come into salvation and there's a process that we could have gone through that we didn't, then we know what's true, um, but we don't know what the truth is. We know that Jesus is true, we know those things about him are true, but we've not encountered truth. And there's a huge difference between what is true and what is truth. Like it could be true that a person has a bad temper, but the truth is they're a new creation in Christ. All the old things have passed away. So are you going to work on what is true? I've got this bad temper, I need to do something about it. Or are you actually going to say, Lord, I want to have an encounter with your truth and I want to start from that place? You know, God gives us options in these things and there isn't a uh, predetermined necessarily way of going about getting saved. It's different for all of us because we're all different and we've all gone through, you know, vastly different situations. Um, you know, my own life was like that. I didn't even know that Jesus existed. I, I lived in a, a family, you know, that had been a crime family for a thousand years. And we had no sense of even our own country and our own culture. We had our own separate culture. And God never even figured in it. I didn't even know who Jesus was uh, until, I, until I met him. <laughs> and I'm the first white sheep in our family's entire history. <laughs> so it, you come to things different. 
Um, and then you have to learn the process of how God wants to walk with you. So, um, and there's no one way for that. It's deeply personal. You can't, you can't be prescriptive about hardly any of that. You can be descriptive and say, well, this was my story. And maybe some of that will work for you. But every one of us has to find the path that God has created for us to know him and the ways in which he wants to come to us. Because there's no one prescribed way in the sense of how you hear God or how you engage God or how he engages you. It'll be different. And then just when you get used to it, he'll switch it up. Yeah, because he's always wanting to take you higher and further in. And so then, you know, you start out with this great relationship as a child, and then suddenly, you know, you realize spiritually you're a spotty adolescent, and you need to do something different. You know, the four stages of growing up with God, it's all there in the scripture. And, and you realize God takes you through different levels into different places because he's got different things to give you and so he wants to create different environments. And he's all about that. He's not, we're the one dimensional ones, he's multi-dimensional. And I often say to people, you know, I'm really, thanks for everything nice you say about me, but the truth is, I'm just a one dimensional man walking with a multi-dimensional God and he's made all the difference. And I'm still learning that multi-dimensionality. Seven years ago, he said to me, Gray, what would it take for you to believe I'm unceasingly magnificent? We're still talking about it. But he's still showing me stuff. And it's like, it's changing my whole world again. And making me see something different about the kingdom. And that's what I think I'm endlessly fascinated about. Uh, that brings up something that is one of the questions here too. What, um, what encounters with the Lord made the biggest impact on you? And our, our encounters, do they come in degrees? Like you know, there's, there's more nuanced kind of Lord speaking to you and then there's these powerful encounters. Wow. <clears throat> One of the funniest encounters I ever had with the Lord. Most of my encounters start in dreams. You know, I'm, apparently I'm a dreamer. So, and, uh, and I've had, you know, open visions um, numerous times. And one of my funniest encounters was I was walking down the street talking to the Lord and somebody grabbed my hand. So I looked down, and I can feel the pressure on my hand, but there's nobody there. And I'm saying, Lord, this is weird. And he said, don't call me weird. <laughs> I'm going, what? He said, just hold my hand, we're talking. And I'm realizing that's a very Hebrew thing. You know, it's a very Eastern European thing. You know, guys who are best friends hold hands. Nothing to do with being gay or anything like that. It's just, it's a sign of relationship. It's a bond. And so I'm walking down the road and I'm holding hands with the Lord and I can hear his voice. You know, I heard his voice in my heart. I, I was talking to him in my heart and then suddenly I feel his hand and I'm hearing his voice audibly. And we're talking and I'm saying... How is this not weird for you? <laughs> and he just said, uh, I've done it a million times. <laughs> and then I'm walking down the street with uh, one of my boys, and he said, Dad, is, uh, is the big fella there? <laughs> and I said, how do you know? He said, you're doing that thing with your hand again. <laughs> Oh, the, sometimes that I maintain that, you know, I had a full head of hair until Jesus started getting affectionate. 
And then he started rubbing my head, and that, that was it. So I'm putting in for a wig when I get to heaven. I'm going to wear a rug for eternity, I think. And I feel him. I feel him like, you know, just like I do with my kids, you know, just tousle their head, you know. I feel that. He is extremely affectionate and funny. But the, the funniest of the three is the Holy Spirit. Total genius, absolute comedian. I mean, look at all the raw material. <laughs> It's amazing. But here's the thing is, it's up to you to decide what kind of relationship you want. Because he gives you that freedom and that right. And then he'll, and then he'll totally surprise you. So the, the key thing for me is that every one of us, you need to have a mindset about the kind of relationship you want with the Lord and start there. And he'll meet you in that. So I've learned that, you know, I have a mindset that God is affectionate. And he's delighted with me. And so I start every day with that. And I go through everything like, this is my mindset. You know, so that's the way I'm going to think. And it's the way I'm going to talk to him. It's the way I'm going to pray. It's the way I'm going to worship. This is what I'm going to do. And I'm just saying, Lord, I'll do this until something better comes along. And then I'll do that. So over to you. If you don't like what I'm doing, you can change it anytime you like. But he's like, no, I like that. Do you feel that people can, because uh, I... I've talked to enough people that most people do not engage at that level right. with God. So they don't feel, they don't, I mean, they sense yeah. impressions, things like that. Right. Is that because of gifting uh, from the Lord or can you move toward that type of a uh, I think it's, a lot of the time it's because, you know, we have a kind of learned helplessness. And, and I think there are some churches that really, you know, use that. And the environment, sometimes the environments we have in church are not really conducive mm -hmm. to worship or the way in which we do our meetings. They're all about efficiency and economy rather than engagement and expectation. And, um, and the Lord is deeply personal. And so, if you believe, if you have a mindset that says God is deeply personal, then you will have a deeply personal relationship. He give, let this mind be in you that was in Christ. God wants us, set your mind on things above, not on things on the world. There's a different way of thinking, and you can go after it. And you just need to start. You don't need to be accurate. You just need to be on the road. You just need to start. It's easier to redirect a moving ship than one that's tied up to the pier. So just get out in the current and say, Lord, I want to believe these things about you. And he will press into you. So if you want a mindset, be asking the Lord, what kind of mindset do you want me to have? When he said to me, what would it take for you to believe? I'm unceasingly magnificent. What's he doing? He's creating a mindset with me. He's creating a majesty mindset. Now, everything begins with a mindset. The mind of Christ, how you think, what you think about God is the most important thing in the world. There is nothing more important than that. And what God thinks about you is the most important thing in your world. So you can start a mindset with God this evening. You can just start a conversation. What kind of, what do you, how do you want me to think about you? How do you think about me? If this is a, if we're really believing that, that he's a personal savior, then these are the questions. I have um, like 40 life processing questions that I've used over the last 45 years. Uh, I still need to give you that set. 
<laughs> but it, questions like, Lord, thank you for this situation. What is it you want to be for me now? So, Lord, you're in me. So when you, if you're looking out through my eyes, how do you see this person? I ask questions like that, and I jolly well expect to get an answer. Because God is not silent on these things. But the key thing is, you have to be curious. I am totally curious about God. And I'm an explorer. I'm exploring Jesus all the time. He's big country. I was out in Montana doing a, um, an event and uh, I had the afternoon off, so I just said, drive me right out into a place where nobody lives and just leave me alone, for a, just drop me and leave me for a couple of hours. So we drove right out and I sat on a rock in the middle of Montana and I didn't see a car or a person or anybody until they came back and got me. It was fabulous. <laughs> it was me and the Lord and all he said to me was, you see all this? This is me. I'm Graham. I'm big country. And I'm thinking, you are. And I want to explore every bit of you before I die. And then I'm going to spend the rest of eternity telling you what I learned. <laughs> I'm curious, right? At least let's be curious. Let's be thinking, you know, Lord, I start with the premise all the time. He's good. And then I go on from there. He wants to bless me. Then I go on from there. I never start from a negative. I always choose. You get to choose the way you think. So choose something good and think it. And then just keep thinking it and you'll get a breakthrough. You know, it's the, it's the renewing of the mind is key. Transformation comes by the renewing of your mind. Lay aside the old man, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man. You know, the link there is, if you're laying aside the old, you better have a great thought about what's coming at you, you know, so that you can not only welcome it, but keep it, yeah? I, I love the way I think. I did two brilliant events. One was called The Art of Thinking Brilliantly which was astonishing. That's the, that was the first fruit of um, what would it take for you to think that I'm extremely, exceedingly you know, magnificent towards you. That was the first fruit, the art of thinking brilliantly. And then when I thought for a few more years, I did Mind of a Saint, which was like, Mind of a Saint is the art of thinking brilliantly on steroids. Oh my gosh, that will take you into places with God that you didn't even know your brain could go there. And so that's where I live now, in that space. So I have a great relationship with God in my head and in my heart. I love it. And it's totally real to me. But here's what the Lord is saying, it, you know, we can partner with this, but why don't you start? And the reason he wants you to start, he gives you permission to start, is because he wants to know what you already know and he wants you to understand what you already know. Because sometimes we're so used to, you know, we, we take stuff that's happening from out there and we let it interfere with us in here. And a mindset tells everything else, shut up. A mindset says, no, I'm not thinking that. Now, why would I think that? Only pelicans think like that. I'm not a pelican. A mindset says, this is who I am, this is how I think, and you're not going to disabuse me of this great idea I've got about Jesus. Mindsets are key. Because without a mindset, you can't think properly. And if you can't think properly, you can't talk properly about who you are in the kingdom. So this is a key part of the new man is discovering and acknowledging all the things that are already in you in Christ, Philemon verse six. You playing games over there? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm almost winning here, just hold on. 
<laughs> I'm trying to, I'm thinking through what you said there. So do you feel a person can increase the, the mystical revelatory aspect of how they hear from the Lord? Yeah. Because, I mean, we're filled with the Spirit, who's the Spirit of wisdom and revelation. So to be filled with the Spirit and not expect to have wisdom and revelation, it's kind of like, well, it's, it's very shady. Well, I'm just <laughs> I'm bringing it up because, I mean, your stories are, are, are not common. The stories you share are not what everyone hears. Now, some people may experience it and not talk about it, you know. Right. So how do you, how do you know, uh, this is a little different, but how do you know that what you're experiencing, you know, as you're going into the depths of greater encounter with the Lord, right. relationship with the Lord, right? how do you know you're not going crazy? <laughs> I have a wife. Here's the thing. Say no more. Here, right. Here's the thing. <laughs> they may not be common, but they're absolutely normal. I always feel like what I'm experiencing with God has normalized my life in so many ways. And now normal in the sense of usual, constant, consistent. Whatever God is, he is relentlessly. And God has pursued me with kindness in such a relentless way. 30 odd years ago, he said, Graham, I want to show you my kindness. And I'm thinking, cool, like I'm going to have a great month. I'm still learning. He is relentless about, and I love putting the word relentless, relentlessly and kind next to each other. Whatever God is, he is relentlessly. It's just that, so often we're brought up with some kind of religious construct that just says things are temporary. But my understanding is that we are in eternal life now. So I'm not expecting stuff to go away. I'm expecting to keep it. So I'm partnering with God. So for me, turning a, a revelation into a lifestyle is a key. And I won't stop until it's part of my life because it's the only way I know now. So I'm not situational in my spirituality. I'm totally relational. And I practice, I teach relational learning. So like you can take any one of my CDs and listen to it and, and you'll get something out of it. And then six months later, you'll listen to it again and get something completely different. And then three months after that, you'll listen again and you'll get something completely different. Why? Because it's relational learning. And so the teaching will adjust to the situations you're in three, six, nine, 12 months down the line, which is why a lot of you like my stuff. <laughs> because it saves you a lot of money. Right? <laughs> you, you can't listen to one of my messages once. You have to listen to it because there's layers and layers and layers and levels. And the same truth will work on you even if you're in a different situation. That's a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Totally blaming the Holy Spirit for that. But I expect to change. And I like change. I think sometimes the church is a refuge from change. Rather than the catalyst we are supposed to be catalytic converters in, in society. We are the change agents, but it seems to me sometimes that we need to change the most. You know? Um, but me, I expect to change. I love it. I love it when I see something different. I get, me and the Lord get so excited. It's like I know the excitement of the Holy Spirit when he's teaching me something. It's like he won't leave you alone. I have to like not sleep for a couple of nights or something because he's so excited. And I'm thinking, okay, let's write all this stuff down. 
and then you need to put me out so I can sleep. (laughs) But I love the excitement of God, and it's tangible. It's physical. It's real to me. And I want that kind of relationship with the Lord. The Bible's not just a book to me. Mm. It's a book about the real word, who is Jesus. The Bible is a book about what the word of life is all about. But the word of life is a person. It's not a piece of writing. The book is scripture. It's not the fourth member of the Trinity. But it opens up. It tells us all the stories that are possible between God and men. It tells us in situations, this is how you can stand. This is what you can do. This is how you can be with God. This is how God will come to you. It tells you all of that. And so sometimes, you know, I'm in a situation and, and the Lord says, I want, you to, I want you to study this. And I said, why am I doing that? He said, because the way that I was with Joshua there is the way that I'm going to be with you here. That's how he uses the book, right? Um, he uses it because so, he applies truth to us. We don't apply it to ourselves. The truth is a person living in you who is intent on coming out of you, you know? So I love all of that interaction and engagement. And, and I have... Um, a jolly good level of expectation in who God is. I expect stuff. I expect God to talk to me. Um, I live in expectation. Hope is the brilliant thing. But hope is a joyful, confident anticipation of something great happening. And I am not being moved away from that place. Mm. So, There's a couple questions here about uh, church... Uh, life and um, one here that's kind of a general question but how, how can we impact a local how can we impact a local church that may not think correctly regarding the new man so I think the question is saying uh, somebody who's in a local <coughs> church that is not thinking in the ways that have been presented here yeah. which af- affects everything yeah. what yeah. do they do about that I mean what's, what's their options on that well, it, it's, it, it, don't do it in a ministry format. Make friends. You know, you're not there to countermand what's going on. You're there just to live your life and see who you can decently infect. It's, it's a relational gospel, and all truth is relational. Start with, if you've got a friend in that place, start with them and show them. And then start with somebody else. And just keep going until, you know, the whole thing either caves in or they throw you out. <laughs> but it's a relational thing. You're not there to speak against the leadership. You're not there to countermand what's going on. You, you, you know, we're not making war with people. We don't fight flesh and blood, but you're there to do what you're doing in the world anyway, which is make friends, relate, and chat to people, get involved, be interested, be engaged with people. So just do that, and then be praying for people, and then you'll get a chance to pray with people, and be faithful to the relational side of God's nature, and he will always show up. Because he loves them too. And, you know, he'll work with you until you both get thrown out. <laughs> My first day ever in church, right? I have this incredible encounter at salvation. And um, I hear the audible voice of God. I feel his arm around my shoulder. I get saved in the middle of a field while I'm on the run from the police. And everything is new. And, and I'm astonished. And I, I find my way to this guy's house, the guy I've been trying to get to, who was my prison visitor. 
when I was in solitary. And um, I, I ring his doorbell, and he opens the door, and he said, what are you doing here, and what's happened to you? And I, and I came in, and, I, and I, in my own words, I said to him, I think I'm having a psychotic episode. Because I had no grid for all of this, you know? And so I told him the story. And he looked at me and he said, Graham, you just met Jesus. And when he said his name, I burst into tears. I haven't cried since I'm three years old. Because it's the first thing my family do is they beat it out of you. Because we're criminals and we're also street fighters. So I had that beaten out of me. So I haven't cried since I'm three. And I, and I, and I cried. Just the name of Jesus. That was kind of cool. <laughs> anyway, so after a few weeks of chatting to him and so on, you know, he said, well, do you want to go to church? I'm thinking, yeah. Because I'm thinking... I'm going to have all these great people to share life with. And so God is totally real to me. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm in my bedroom in this guy's house, and I'm re I've read through the Gospels. I get into the book of Acts, and I read the bit about Pentecost. And so I just, I just looked at that, and I said, uh, Lord, I haven't had that yet. So um, it's like ordering from a menu, you know? So it's like... <laughs> Lord, so I'd like um, the rushing wind and speaking in tongues, um, if that's okay. And about 30 seconds later, my window blew in, this wind came all around, and I spoke in tongues for like six hours. So I'm thinking, okay, smart, I know how this works now. What you read in here belongs to you. What you read in here belongs to you. So I'm walking, I'm going to church, I'm so excited. And I'm walking down the road and I'm talking to the Lord. And I can hear his voice. We're having an audible conversation, I can hear it. And so we get south, I think it was a Methodist church. And so I, I walked in, so I opened the door for the Lord. And then I walked in and suddenly he's not there. And so I'm in the foyer and I, I've lost his presence, he's not there. So I don't know anything, right? So I look around and I see, you know, the men's restroom and I'm thinking, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know anything. He's a real person to me. So I'm waiting. I waited for like 10 minutes and then I went into the, there's people in the foyer, nobody spoke to me. Then I went into the, into the um, auditorium and it smelled really dusty and a bit like mildew. And I'm thinking, wow. And everyone seemed joyless. And so I came back into the foyer. And then I'm getting worried about God. <laughs> so I stuck my head in the restroom and just called out, are you okay? <laughs> and I didn't hear anything. So I went outside the building. And there he is on the sidewalk. So I just said, I thought you were in here. He said, oh, no, I'm not welcome here. And I just said, well, if you're not going, I'm not going. And we walked home. And then I said, okay, you need to talk to me about this. And then he, he was like trying to talk to me about religion and why some people prefer a book to his presence. And I'm like, I just, but I don't, I don't get it. And I was really genuine, I was puzzled. I'm saying, but don't they know how lovely you are? And he, and he said, well, not yet. And so we just walked home. My first day, like, well, it's not my first day in the kingdom, but it's my first day, you know, <laughs> in the church. So, <laughs> church world, yeah. So, and then, so then I said, okay, well, I need to go to a place where people, I can engage with people like in the way that you engage with them. And he just said to me, okay, so um, you're going to have to move then. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there isn't really a church 
in this town that you could safely be with. And so I had to move like 30 miles away. And then I said, so which church do I go to here? And um, he said, I'll bring someone to you. And then the first people I met were guys who had come out of traditional church and they, they started what effectively was the house church movement in the UK. They'd been out of the church. They came out not because they were fed up or anything. They came out because they needed more of Jesus and they needed it quick. So they came out and they'd been meeting together, a small crowd of them, and they'd been growing. And so I joined this house church group and it was absolutely gorgeous because I could talk to them about who I was and, and they would all had encounters with God that rocked them. And, and I think, honestly, we are designed to have, you know, three or four or half a dozen major encounters a year. We're designed that way. You know, um, because Jesus is a quickening spirit. And you don't have to understand everything in order to become it. It's not often the way revelation works. God doesn't work logically about these things. You know, he works relationally. I mean, how do you, how do you be with someone when, when they tell you their version of, re, of reason? It's like, come now, let's reason together. And then he says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Which, if you wanted to be Monty Python's version of that, it's like God saying, come now, let's reason together. I can make red things white. <laughs> what? I can make red things white. Now, every, everyone, anyone who's ever done laundry <laughs> knows you can't put a red thing in with a white thing without the white thing turning pink. Yeah. Red is like one of the most impossible colors to turn into white. And so what he's saying is, this is my reason. This is how I think. This is how I reason. This is my rationale. I'm doing the impossible. Amen. That's it. That's it. That's what passes for logic in that beautiful brain of his. And Jesus came talking about possibilities. He never once talked about a problem. He talked about everything is possible. All things are possible. What's impossible with man is entirely possible with God. What's he doing? He's saying this is how we reason stuff out. We do the impossible. So nothing is impossible to us. Nothing's too hard for us. You know? My yoke is easy, my burden is like, you know, we do the impossible every single day and we'll do it for you constantly. But it's a mindset. This is, this is how God does logic. He does logic in a way that enables you to trust and have faith. Your mind is designed to explore God, not rule him out. Just saying. Two more questions left. Uh, one is, what does a matured, matured church look like? Like, what, what is, give us the, and, oh and let me ask you this. As you're thinking about that, are, <laughs> right. are some churches meant to be at the shallow end of the pool? Like, are there churches that are like gathering churches and then other churches that are training churches and so forth? You know, you are as deep as your expectation. Sounds like expectation is a big part of this. It's a huge thing. Because, yeah. you know, we are living with a multidimensional person who adores us. We're living with someone who does the impossible every single day. We're living with someone who thinks so completely, wonderfully different from us. Why would you not want to take advantage of that? And so sometimes, you know, our learning places are shallow 
because we don't really entertain the idea of God taking us deep. And, 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 and I think, too, that in standard evangelicalism, we are deeply suspicious of experience and encounter. It's like, you know, don't get emotional. I mean, God is emotional about me. I've had the Holy Spirit cry on my shoulder when my brother died. And I'm, you know, I'm in a different country and I find out that he's dead and I adored my brother and I'm bereft. And, and the Holy Spirit comes into my hotel room and grabs hold of me and I start crying and then he starts crying and I get comforted. I get comforted. That's a real tangible thing. He's as real as that. And not to believe that God is that real, that might class itself as a sin. Not to believe that God is glorious, that the glory of God is that he is good. I believe in the goodness of God in a tangible, physical, visceral way. And comfort is not a head thing. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grieving here, but my head is okay. It's like, what are you taking? <laughs> it's real. God is real. And so we are pursuing a real relationship. And are people going to get over-emotional? For sure. But I would rather have people over-emotional than people shut down. Because you can change that, but you can't change the other. You know, not without some TNT. <laughs> so, so for me, experience is everything. We are given lives and, 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 and put on a world so that we can experience everything in life. I experience my grandkids, my friends, my wife, um, curry. <laughs> I mean, curry, having a curry, it's like having a party in your mouth. That's an experience, right? So we're full of experiences, and we're having experiences all the time. It's just for me, my heart is set on having great ones. And if there's something bad coming along, I'm so going to turn it into something else. Because I can. Right? That's what being saved means. You're converted to Jesus, so you can pretty much convert everything around you. And that's what we're doing. I, I on my staff training, because I call my companies brilliant. Brilliant book house, brilliant TV, brilliant perspectives. Because I, expect, because I think Jesus is brilliant. And the word brilliant is a quintessential English word. You know, so uh, for me, Jesus is brilliant. So when we're training new staff, you know, the first thing I get the first hour of the first day, and what I'm saying to people is, you know, listen, I don't pay you to deal with problems. I pay you to turn them into possibilities and come and talk to me about them. We don't deal with negatives in my in any of my companies. We don't deal with problems. We only deal with possibilities. The first time I taught my staff, Jenny, my PA, who's just a hoot, she, two days later, my, my door crashes in and Jenny jumps into the office and she goes, we have three exciting possibilities. <laughs> and I'm sat there going, that's what I'm talking about right there. And then we talked about the three possibilities, and then we prayed, and then we said, Lord, in the absence of you saying anything, we're going to choose that one. But we're going to give you a day to make up your mind if you need it. <laughs> but we ain't waiting around for you, you know, I mean, we're choosing this one because we like it. And, you know, more often than not, probably 80% of the time, the Lord said, I like that choice. So we'll, we'll do that. That's what we're doing. We... We don't have to accept life as it comes at us on this level. We can take it to another level. 
and see what it looks like there. Because we can, because that's who God is. That's what God is like. So we're never stuck with something. And I'm always hopeful. Does everything work out? No, I'm still learning. But I'm enjoying what I'm learning. Because another key rule for us in Brilliant is, whatever happens, we're going to love the learning. And if you love the learning, you don't try and escape from it. You know? Last question. Uh, um, what will be your uh, legacy? What are you working toward? Oh, that's a great question. I'm actually doing a lot of legacy writing right now. Um, I want to complete the reformation that Luther started. That's what I want. I want to see the bride of Christ. I want to see the beauty. I want, I, I, my legacy is I, I don't want to see any more apostolic networks or denominations. I want to see apostolic cities. I want to see apostolic states. I want, I want the great unanswered prayer of Jesus in John 17 that they may be one even as we are one. I want that to be answered before I die. I want to see the body of Christ in a city come together. I want to see one mind, one spirit, you know, one voice. I want to see all of that in the body of Christ. I want to see the bride, you know, growing. I want to see the beauty that the church can, can create in, in a city. I want to... St- seeing the body of Christ rebuilding ruined cities. You know, the the mission statement of Jesus in Isaiah 61. Repairing and rebuilding the ruined places and the places that have been devastated. But right now, we're all in our denominations and networks and we're all exclusive and excluded from each other. Yeah, we could come together and touch, but we don't come together and grip. You know, we touch each other and we have respect for each other and that's nice. But it's, it's not going to get the job done. There is no one denomination that's going to do it. There's no one network that's going to do it. And I don't care how powerful you are, you can't do it by your own because God has already, he's already decreed that. So you being exclusive is not helping the kingdom. And the kingdom is everything. Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of the fellowship. And we need to see that. And so I want that to be part of my legacy. I want to be partnering with people in that. I want to see the real church emerge in Cleveland. I want to see it happen. I want to see it happen. I don't, I'm not prescriptive about how that can happen. I think there are a multiplicity of ways in which we could start to create that. You know, we could start taking down some walls and some barriers. We could, it really starts with being, becoming friends and loving each other and being generous and, and, and letting the oil of the Holy Spirit, you know, soak all of us into a different place. And, but I want to I wanna see, I want Jesus to really have what he died for and he doesn't have it right now. I want to see the corporate man rise up and take possession of territory where they're living. He doesn't have, we don't, we're not seeing anywhere the measure of the stature of the corporate man of Christ. And so we, if we want him to come back, we need to create the environment for him to come. And, and that's one of the critical things on his agenda is one heart, one mind, one voice, one spirit. That we are the same as the three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're in that level of unity where we love each other, we work together, and it's not about who gets what. It's about who does what. You know? So, 
anyway. Good. Let's thank Grant Graham. This is great. <laughs>